So, greetings of the day, everyone. I, Riddhi Vatu, take it to be a privilege to welcome you all into the first children's edition of Orange City Literature Festival organized by SGR Knowledge Foundation in association with GA Trisoni University, powered by Raisoni Group of Institutions. The motive behind the fest is to explore the ways which should help students develop emotional intelligence. Parents today are worried about how to take the children off gadgets. When is the correct time to give such gadgets to the children? Reading habits need to get developed in them and how they can help their children read more and understand what they are reading. These are all questions that parents have been grappling with, some consciously and ahead of time, and some retrospectively once they see the impact of their choices. Today we have with us the former headmaster of the Doom School, Dehradun, Mr. Matthew Rajet, who will be sharing some of these things he has learned over the years as a parent of three children and as a teacher and school leader of thousands of other people's children under the topping of helping your child become a better leader and thinker. So before we begin with the session for today, I would like to introduce Matthew, sir. Matthew Rajat, sir, is a British educator, writer, and former headmaster of the Doon School, the all-boys boarding school in Dehradun, India. Sir's work at Doon focused on improving the quality of teaching and learning, growing the provision of factorial care, and implementing the Cambridge IGCSE assessment for grade 10 that previous board and the headmaster had introduced. This was in addition to developing the already existing international baccalaureate and in India school certificate programs. He wrote, your child's first step towards success and how your child can win in life, both published by Jagannath Books in 2019. So now leads an educational consultancy, MR Ed Partners, based in Leipzig, Germany, which helps global institutions improve their pedagogical practices in various ways, including better design of systems, curricula, and school environment. Matthew Sir also worked with Whitelist European Project, a vocational education and training center in Leipzig, to develop their offerings for students and teachers coming to Germany to Erasmus Plus program. Most recently, Sir has joined his friend Garrett Johnson in GRJ Education, to develop a training program for school leaders in the UK and internationally and has joined the Dexter's team as a consultant for their Indian School Leaders program designed around implementation of the NEP 2020. A very eminent and knowledgeable personality, we welcome you, sir. And without further ado, I would like to, like to hand over the session to you. Thank you very much for your warm welcome, Riddy, and thanks to the sponsors of the event, uh, and good luck for the uh, Orange City Literary Festival, the first children's edition. I think it's a, a wonderful move to have a children's literary festival. Let me just start by uh, by showing um, a picture that I took when I was visiting uh, one of my sons who's at university in the Netherlands. This is This is how books fill the environment. Uh, in some parts of the world. Yeah? The, the graffiti uh, is making it plain that books matter to this, uh, to this community. Um, so we're all here uh, as interested uh, people in children's development and learning. Uh, thank you for coming. Um, I think whether you're a parent, uh, an uncle, an aunt, a grandparent, maybe a teacher, or perhaps just a friend of people with children. I hope that there's something in uh, what I'll be sharing uh, for all of you. Um, I think that in a world where being an influencer has become a profession for some uh, and an ambition for many, we need to have more good influencers in the lives of our children. Uh, people who can show them the door to learning and connection uh, rather than showing them some distorted vision of life uh, that fills them with envy, uh, self-loathing and anger, which is what I see a lot of uh, when I look at what young people are, are reading, listening to uh, and watching uh, these days. <laughs> it's not just young people, it's plenty of adults as well. We live in a polarised society where things are falling apart at the edges a little bit. 
So what I'm going to be talking about today uh, is how to become a reading influencer. So as Riddy said, I've, I've worked with thousands of children over the years. I've been a teacher and a school leader in seven different countries uh, for the, in the last 25 years. Um, and after that kind of time, you start to see patterns emerge uh, with the students you work with. I think that many of the difficulties that children have in school uh, and in their relationships and in understanding what's going on around them, uh, there's sometimes issues uh, and behaviours that their parents have shown them, often inadvertently, uh, through their interactions, conversations and choices. And as a teacher, certainly, once you understand that you're working not just with students, but with parental legacy, it helps you be a better teacher and a school leader for them. So I know very well that parenting is a difficult job. Thousands of uh, parents ha have told me this over the years. And I have three of my own children. Two of them are now adults. Uh, one of them is just finishing the 10th class. I know it's uh, a job that requires a great deal of thought and a great deal of energy in practice. And I know that that we plan our families, we plan our pregnancies, we plan our children's births very well. But sometimes we don't always plan how we're going to approach things together as our child grows. Things like reading or introducing sugar to their diet or when do we let them watch things and have devices? Uh, we all know that we want our children to read, uh, like we know that we don't want them to smoke and drink. But sometimes we smoke and drink and sometimes we don't read. So I think that something is incredibly important for us as parents or people in the lives of children is uh, to recognize that children see and learn everything. And it's what their brains are designed to do. If you want to read something about that, Steven Pinker's book, The Blank Slate, is a fantastic exploration of how our brains are designed to acquire and learn everything that's going on around us. And of course, if you think, when else can we acquire language so fluently as in childhood? Children are machines designed to learn. And they learn everything that we show and signal to them. Um, so we'd better be present and not distracted when we're with our children. And these days that means not distracted by our devices. So put it away, turn off the notifications and put it on silent when you're at home, because that's a different job from the rest of the day. And our children need us to be there because what we're doing with them is we're setting their foundation. That's not a school's job, that's our job. Um, and children learn and acquire their disposition from their parents. So when children are curious, when they're enthusiastic and when they strive to help others, they're learning that from home. And when they're aggressive and vain and find it difficult to maintain relationships, it's also something that they're learning. The way that we behave as parents is a gift or a curse that we give our children. So we're role models to the children and they do and become what they see us doing and being, which is of course, as it should be. If we're not their most important influencers, then really what are we doing? Now this changes as a child grows older and in their teens, it's their friends who become more important influencers. And again, that's a normal part of development and growing up. So we have to help them find their moral compass, their personality, and get their interests in place before they become teenagers. And, and it's an important job. Schools help us in that, but fundamentally they come back to us each day, each holiday, each weekend. Uh, and we're checking in with them to see, is everything aligned? Is everything working well? But remember uh, that like a good education, we can only teach them to think. We can't teach them what to think. I don't know if you've ever read uh, The Prophet by Khalil Gibran. 
Uh, he wrote it in 1923, but it's as fresh today as it was then. I'll just read a little excerpt from the, the chapter on children. He says, your children are not your children. They are the sons and daughters of life's longing for itself. They come through you, but not from you. And they are with you, yet they belong not to you. You may give them your love, but not your thoughts, for they have their own thoughts. You may house their bodies, but not their souls, for their souls dwell in the house of tomorrow, which you cannot visit, not even in your dreams. A beautiful expression, I think, of what, what it means to parent children and, and to set off young adults. So, so where do we start? Where do we start as parents? Well, we start by reading with our babies. We start by giving routines, closeness, and, and language development to them. Reading to our children is possibly the best investment that we can make in their foundation and their future. And that's in any language. In our own mother tongue, we are going to be the best readers. And maybe we're not even reading. Maybe we're just telling stories stories that we heard when we were young that our grandparents told us stories about when we were children what life was like and even if they're tiny babies and they don't understand what you're saying they're still learning they're learning when you're holding them and talking and reading and they're learning about rhythm and the sound of words and eventually they'll make those same sounds in their own mouths and whether you're reading with a brightly coloured board book written for young children or whether it's an article from The Economist, you can read it in a way that will make them enjoy what they're doing with you. Yeah? The content doesn't matter to begin with. You're not teaching them to read. You're just teaching them to be and enjoy words and listening. And like having meal times together, reading during the day, and before bed should become a normal activity at home and books should be part of the furniture in the house. Let me share a picture of some parents uh, I admire. These are uh, friends of mine in Derridan. Um, you can see that the furniture in the house, there's decorations, there's people, there's awards, there's flowers in the background, but there's books on the shelf. Uh, and when when this is a normal part of a family home, then you can expect that it becomes a normal part of your child's life. Now, I don't, I don't know about you, uh, but we'd all love giving things to our children. And often I visit people's homes and I see how many things their children have. It needs to be the same with books. Yeah? And I think that many parents spend more on coffee than they do on books. And at $6 for a latte in Starbucks, that's a lot of investment in your child's future down the drain. It's better to take a bottle of water and buy a book, yeah? So make sure that at times of giving, that books are included. Maybe give books instead of giving flowers and chocolate. They, they last longer and they contain more, yeah? So, we make sure that books become part of the scenery of our children's lives. And we make sure that books become an activity as well. When we're at home with our children, when we travel with our children, the playrooms of our children, we may have a toy basket, a basket of musical instruments. We may have a dress up basket, the most popular toy in my house. And we should have a book basket where the books are changing, some favorites remain. I think that just like a, a healthy diet of protein and fruit and vegetables and water, a child's mind is developed through play, through movement, through listening, seeing and thinking. And missing out on any one of those things will have an impact on their development. And for a long time as a parent, you get to choose what they're playing with, what they're listening to, what they're seeing and reading. Now, of course, you can't choose what they're thinking and feeling, 
but you can learn this from them if it's what you're talking about with them. So by talking to them and by asking good questions and listening, you're going to have access to their world. I think that reading causes thinking and talking is how we share thinking before we learn to write. So make books part of your days out. What are the libraries like near you? Are there bookshops near you? You can visit bookshops, you don't have to buy books. And there are reading events, of course, and congratulations, you're here, well done, excellent parenting. Visit the libraries around you. Libraries should be visual, literary and tactile delights for children. They're like theme parks for thinking. I think it's, it's real though that bookshops have become better at selling books to children than libraries have in the sense of giving ideas and sharing the joy of reading because that's the business they're in. But we can all take advantage of that too. I think that on your days out, make sure that the travel that you do is filled with some good picture rich non-fiction books for the journey in the car or an audio book or podcast that you can listen to and enjoy together. I want to show a couple of pictures uh, of libraries uh, that I've seen recently. Here's a library at a school in Dubai. The library isn't just books on shelves. It's puzzles, it's games, it's places you can relax and sit down and enjoy books and enjoy books together. And here's a picture of a library that's pretending to be a bookshop. In fact, the furniture came from a bookshop. This is a library in, in a school in Singapore. And look at the way the books are presented. They're presented by themes and ideas, numbers, emotions, all books around things that matter to students and children. So, children love also listening to you reading. You do this when they're young, we do it as they grow, and they're learning not just the words, but they're learning the rhythm, they're learning the accent, and they're learning the emotion that you put in to what you're reading. Even when they don't understand the words, they're learning. And when they do start understanding the words, it's important to keep going. When I think back at interviewing students for places in schools, we used to do the interviews at, at Dune where we'd have groups of children together talking about reading and getting them to read. And they were ever so good at reading words, but not so good at reading sentences or what came in between the words. And they get better at that when they listen to you reading. So a simple sentence like, I didn't kiss my grandma, can change when you put emphasis, punctuation, emotion and meaning on different words in there. I didn't kiss my grandma. I didn't kiss my grandma. I didn't kiss my grandma. All of these have different meanings. But if children only learn to read words and we're delighted with that and don't explore meaning of the words, then they're never really sure what's being said, written about or shared. And never mind punctuation of saving lives. Uh, it's time to eat children or it's time to eat children. Depends on the punctuation. Uh, Eats, Shoots and Leaves by Lynn Trust is a wonderful exploration of language if you want to read something uh, about that. So eventually our children learn to read on our laps, in their beds, at school. But are they thinking? And this is, this is where we need to continue as parents challenging their thoughts about what they read. So do we talk to our children about what they're reading? And do we also read what they are reading? 
so that we can have a meaningful conversation with them about it. If we're not readers, then reading as our children read will also help us become better at doing this. So when your children bring books home from school, make sure that you're reading them too. What's a book about is an important question. Lots of school children read George Orwell's Animal Farm. Some of them think it's a story about animals living on a farm, and that's missing the point entirely. And again, those interviews at Dune and other schools I've worked at, when you ask children, why do we read? The most common answer back is to improve our vocabulary. Well, I don't think any of them are reading dictionaries. I mean, that perhaps would do the job better. We don't read to improve our vocabulary. Our vocabulary improves because we read. Nobel Prizes in literature are not given for good stories. They're given because literature explores what it means to be human and to be alive and the challenges and heartbreaks and, and joys of the human condition. And that's what we have to help our children understand about reading. So we need to ask good questions. And good questions are usually questions that you don't know the answer to. I think that too many adults use questions to test or confirm what they know or think. And too many don't wait long enough for an answer. So good questions are opening conversations, not closing it. And children often don't know what they're thinking until they start talking. So you have to let them talk and listen. And something that I've seen in many schools over the years is that teachers move on too quickly. They don't listen to what the children are thinking out loud. And it's a tragedy because too many teachers also love a quiet classroom where everyone agrees with them. And that's how we teach obedience. And that's also why girls do better in schools than boys do. And that leads to all sorts of problems later on in society. We mustn't be teaching obedience in school. We must be teaching thinking. So what's a good question then to ask your child? And this works at almost any age when they can talk about what they're reading. So. What can you learn about the characters in the book they're reading? What have they learned? What about the choices that the characters make and why they made those choices? And what were the consequences of those choices? Books don't set out, this is what the character is like. This is the choices that they make. These were the consequences. They tell it in a tale. So do our children understand what they're reading to have a conversation with us about choices and consequences? Can they draw a picture of what's happening in the book? Can they make a map of connections between characters in the book or key moments, how one led to another? Can they give you an, a, a spoken summary of what happened in the book? Not telling the whole story, but a summary of the key ideas. And how about making connections with what's going on in the world, in their world uh, and in the bigger world outside? Remember that writing and literature is not happening in a vacuum and books don't get banned because of the story. It's the ideas in them that matter. And that's what we need to help our children develop the vocabulary to describe. So as Parents of younger, preteen, and then teenage children, we have a job of curating their reading. We are their librarian at home. And what they read is going to help them understand the world. And it's not only nonfiction that does that. There's a war going on at the moment in Ukraine. There are refugees filling Europe, 20,000 a week come to Leipzig and I'm about a thousand kilometers from the border here. There's literature written about this. 
There's literature from the Second World War. There's literature since the Second World War. Books like Mouse, The Boy in the Striped Pajamas, The Reader, all of these are about what's going on in the world right now, as much as they are about what happened then. And reading these kind of books will help teenagers understand something more about what's happening in the world. But they might need some direction to find these kind of books. So maybe join a book club, talk to your school's librarian. I know that series of books are incredibly popular with children. Harry Potter, Twilight, Enid Blyton, if people are still reading that, uh, Terry Pratchett's books. Um, there's so many series. Of course, publishers love series because you can sell them. Uh, and series can be a wonderful way to explore characters. But they shouldn't become like stamp collecting. I think it's important that we make sure our children are reading different writers from different places and different times. I would never have the opportunity to experience what it's like being a child growing up in Afghanistan or being a, a refugee from that country if I didn't read books like The Kite Runner and A Thousand Splendid Sons. Books give us the opportunity to be other people and to live in other times and to play with time and to play with being other people. So curate what your child is reading. If they want to watch a film, have they read the book? Can you do that together before you see the film? It gives them a much better opportunity to understand what's happening. And once they've seen the film, they very rarely go back and read the book. If you're visiting somewhere, have they read anything about the place that you're visiting? And have they read what you loved to read as a child? It's amazing how, as your children get older, they can actually become more nostalgic for the things that you loved when you were younger. I'll share another picture. Uh, this is a school library um, in Singapore, um, which has something called a core library for each grade level. And these are books that the teachers of those grade levels, most often the English teachers, but other teachers as well, but books that they've suggested as the important foundation books for that age group. Age appropriate, but challenging, interesting and exciting books. So school libraries and librarians. It's an important relationship to develop. Your child needs a relationship with a librarian and perhaps you do as well. If there isn't a school librarian, then keep talking to the principal about where the librarian is. Make, make it your activism. Yeah. The librarians are wonderful at knowing what books are available for students to read. They know what the curriculum in the school is and how to give books to support that curriculum. But do they have things in the library that are really going to matter to your children? The children are growing up in a world where there's a climate emergency. History is being rewritten and politics are polarized and there's gross inequality in the world. How are our children going to learn about that if they're not going to be able to read about it? They've got to do a better job of the future and they can't do it without having access to the past as well. So if you want to take on a project maybe in your neighborhood, then make sure the library is fit for purpose. If there isn't one, can you create one? Or can you make a library in a box for people? So take a look at this. This is something that's happening all over the United States, in Canada and in other parts of the world. It's becoming more common now in Germany too. People are putting these up in their gardens. People are hanging them on the walls of their house. People are even opening windows so that their windowsill becomes a little library where people can swap, exchange books. Waiting rooms 
in uh, bus stations and train stations are doing the same over here as well. Fantastic reading project. So what happens when our children are readers, when they begin reading on their own? Well, I know we all congratulate ourselves as parents and we think, fabulous, job done. I can have my evenings back now. I don't need to read with my child for so long. But a lot of us stop too soon. We think our children are reading and then we stop. And what I would say is that whenever you stop, it's probably too soon. There's so many different types of text and literature that our children need to be shown. Journals, articles, essays, biographies. We need to follow their interests and bring things to the table that we can read and share and talk about. Do we share what we are reading with them? Do we read it out loud to them and keep making it part of the routine in the house? Because as soon as we stop doing that, something else will fill the time. As soon as you stop being that influencer, somebody else will take on that role. I think that the time when it perhaps is safe to stop is when they're sharing their reading with you and they're asking you good questions about what you're reading then you know you've done a decent job and they're ready. I think it's important to recognize though, that like us, our children go through phases. Their development goes through phases. So there'll be times when they are keen readers, when they love a series, when they're following a passion for a while, but then they'll put books down. They'll pick up other things. We just have to make sure that what they're picking up is good for them. You now, phases are natural, but don't stop reading to them. You keep sharing what you read. You keep giving them books. You keep asking them questions. You've already set the foundation and they'll come back to it. And please don't make reading a chore or a punishment, because if you do that, they'll stop reading just to punish you and they'll win. And what about other types of literacy? Obviously, fiction and nonfiction books, that's what we think of when we use the word literacy. But we have musical literacy, artistic literacy, emotional literacy. And how do we support all of these things? And I think that un unless children have developed a vocabulary, it's difficult to talk about these things. OK, but it's possible for you to ask good questions around music, around art and around their feelings. And the more we equip them with vocabulary, then the more able they will be to enjoy a musical life, enjoy an artistic life and enjoy an emotional life where they can connect with other people and where their empathy grows because they understand that we're all emotional beings. And back to the books again, asking them about characters' feelings, asking them about why they made choices, what those consequences were, who got hurt, what happened. Yeah? All of this is gonna help them become better human beings. And I think that we keep going with those questions. Language and behavior are the two greatest ways that we share our thoughts and feelings. Of course, there's art and music and dance and cooking as well. But language development and reading are the preparation for sharing thoughts and feelings in the future. And if we don't have the language, then it's our behavior that dominates. And this can have consequences in families, in friendships and relationships in the future. There's a lot at stake in that sense. So read, share your reading and listen to your children. And you'll be rewarded a thousand fold in the future when they start sharing 
what they're doing with you. And I'm going to stop there. Really? Uh, thank yeah. you so much, sir. Okay. Uh, in fact, I was not planning on a questionnaire session, but from what I heard, in fact, definitely I'm not a parent, and I don't know much about parenting. But so uh, I, I had two questions for you that I really um, wanted to ask. Firstly, during the initial stage of your conversation, you were uh, talking about setting a foundation for the children. The parents have to set a foundation. So what do you think uh, that the parents lack or can have a drawback in setting this foundation at the very initial stage? I, I think at the moment, and it's it's in every country, parents are incredibly busy. They're working incredibly hard to provide things for themselves, for their family. Uh, and in a multi-generational home, you're providing both up and down for your parents and your children. Yeah, um, It's not easy. And you often have both parents working in homes, working hard to send their children to good schools to provide that possibility uh, in the future. And it's so easy to be too busy and it's so easy to be distracted. And I know this so well. I I stopped one job that I had as a housemaster in, in a school uh, because my children noticed and said, you're spending a lot of time with other people's children. Um, we want that too. And at the time they were, you know, eight, four and, and two. Um, now, I was delighted they could articulate that. You know, I was glad that they had the language and the emotional intelligence to do it. Um, and we convince ourselves that we are doing this for our children's benefit. We are acquiring things. We are getting that better job, that busier job. We're working harder for them. But sometimes it, it isn't true. Uh, and we have to recognize that maybe we should have thought about this more. Maybe we need to talk about this. But you can't have two parents working 110 yeah? percent. And I, I feel very lucky. My, my wife and I took a job in Singapore at the United World College there where we shared a full time job. We had a 120 percent contact contract between the two of us for four years. And it was amazing. We, we could study. We could work. We could give our children the time that they needed. It was a, a magical four years. Not everyone has the chance to do that. But we do need to carve out these times in which everything is precious. We okay. put our devices down and we we focus on these children who we decided to have and who are sponges for love and learning. Yeah. Absolutely correct, sir. Uh, so the second question I had for you is uh, in between the conversation you were talking about podcasts. So how do you think uh, the technology and the devices have uh, made the children acquainted to these podcasts? Like you talked about series also. Mm. Me myself was acquainted with these podcasts on Spotify that I hear and listen to. Uh, so how do you think these, these podcasts have taken the children away from the um, old school books that we say? Well, I, th I, th I think that, you know, we're, we, we move a lot. It's hard to read when you're moving. It's impossible to read when you're driving. Yeah. Uh, some people, I, I get, I get car sick if I'm reading in a car. So, so podcasts become a valuable way to kill the time of a commute, uh, or that journey to school, perhaps. Um, and and there are, let's make no mistake, there are amazing podcasts out there. Um, at the moment, I'm I'm loving the Freakonomics podcast. Um, and the, la the last four weeks, they've been questioning the value and the future of college. These are big questions, yeah. Um, but I I also hear 
um teenagers listening to you know the uh, joe rogan's podcast full of angry white men on a regular basis who are so certain of what they're talking about and and a lot of a lot of these influencers i mean but please don't get me wrong dropping out of school is is, is not always a problem and, and not everyone gets what they need from school um but but sharing opinions on politics global economics and, and geopolitical problems you know when when you don't have a huge background in that but you're very popular on youtube it's it's not always healthy um so i think that you know we have to be selective we're selective in the books we choose for our kids we need to try and help them be selective in what they listen to and watch as they as they grow up uh, and i th well, this this is something that schools have realized it's something that schools in india are realizing that the job is to help people become critical thinkers not to teach them what to think um and unfortunately the the way that the curriculum has worked in the past and the way that assessment has worked in the past isn't as meaningful as what it needs to be for example if you look at you know i i isc english literature papers even recent ones you know you've studied romeo and juliet and the questions are things like where was juliet standing when romeo said this to her and you think that is not literature that is gk and gk is arbitrary and meaningless and when you have google in your pocket it it gives you an indication of the value of general knowledge but where do you go for that knowledge what do you understand by the conversation that romeo and juliet were having you know, th these are important questions and i think that if you know for example if you look at the way that cbse literature has changed they're asking more meaningful questions if you look at the way that some of the international curriculum uh, assessment rather not curriculum but the assessments like cambridge and, and ib these, these are far more meaningful and they demand that you are critical in looking at either side of an argument before you reach an opinion or judgment i think it's difficult that in schools a lot of teachers are judgmental so feedback is judgment and it happens quickly and and that that listening and exploring what people mean and challenging ideas sometimes only a parent has the time to do that if you've got a class of 30 40 50 students it's not happening as a discussion yeah so again parents need to be the ones having those conversations and questions and like i said if you're if you're not the ones doing that someone else will do it yeah it's going to be joe rogan <laughs> it's going to it's going to be so else. That, that that's actually correct uh, and i liked one sentence that you mentioned in your uh, talk that a parent can tell a child what uh, to think but they can't tell the child what to think they can't stimulate the mind of the children and that, that's really something to ponder upon by the parents i see yeah, and again, it's tied up with this idea of obedience and compliance. You know, it life is really easy when you have a quiet, obedient child. But the consequence of that is you're you're going to have someone who will not stand up and say, "Hang on, that's not right." You know, if they see something bad happening, they they don't know how to act or behave. What what we want are people who are able to be activists people who are able to stand up for things that are right to support weaker people who have been perhaps you know subject to appalling disenfranchisement or appalling abuse or neglect um you see that all over the world it it it, it happens in germany as well as in india and as well as in the uk preparing children to to stand up and be ready to be there's a guy called phil 
Zimbardo. He was he was the psychologist who did the Stanford prison experiment. And he talks about schools needing to prepare heroes in waiting. People who can stand up and be ready to help others deal with things that are not fair and not right. That's what we need to do in schools. Absolutely. Uh, stimulating the children's mind in a certain way is really uh, the need of the hour, I feel, to keep them away from all these demons that are like technology, mostly, I see. Oh, come on, Let, let's be honest. We're using technology right now to do something that's really useful and valuable. I'm sat in Germany. You're sat in India. We're communicating and sharing this with other people. So technology is amazing. Uh, it's how I keep in touch with two of my adult children who are not here. Um, and, and when I think about how lonely I felt as a young adult going out into the world, I would love to have had this easy WhatsApp communication with my parents, but I had a telephone that I had to have coins for that I had to queue up. They just didn't work. Yeah. So we, we, I suppose it, it's like anything, you know, we need to teach them to do things responsibly. I, I, I love, I love the way that Germany has a relationship with alcohol that is very different from the UK where I grew up and very different from India as well and from the US. So beer and wine are a normal part of a family meal and they are a normal thing in the lives of, of 16 year olds. Yeah, but 18 year olds in the UK drink and develop problems and they make bad decisions. Yeah. And 21 year olds in the US, they're, they're just learning then how, how to use yeah. alcohol sensibly you know if, if you make certain things difficult and hide things away then there are all sorts of difficulties associated later on absolutely yeah. that, that's so correct so <laughs> with the formative time we have uh it's time to conclude today's session so if you'd like me to move towards the concluding note Thank you. Please do, really. It was a, a pleasure uh, meeting you and having a conversation with you as well. Uh, and I hope. Uh, it was our pleasure, bro. It was our pleasure to have you, in fact. So thank you so much for that. Uh, right. It was a pleasure being part of this session. It was good to hear thoughts, your thoughts on these topics of reading, parenting, role modeling, developing a foundation, and how to stimulate emotional intelligence into the children. Our audience can get their copy of your book from the link provided in the description or visit a Crossword City store in their city. The session was supported by Dr. North Publication. You can also get your copies of How Your Child Can Win in Life from the Dr. North website, a must read book for all the parents today. Wishing you all a very happy reading, friends. Thank you so much, sir, and thank you to the audience for being online with us today. And get ready for the quiz based on this session and visit www.oclf.com uh, to participate in a quiz and win uh, exciting gifts and prizes. A gigantic Orange City Literature Festival will be back in November 2022 in the city of Nagpur, the city of Orange. So get ready for the physical fest coming up this winter, attending awesome sessions and interacting with your favorite authors. Keep following us for the updates of Festival of Words. Thank you so much. It was a pleasure having you, sir, on this session. Thank you. Love it.